Hello, my name is Sanjay Kallapur. My research is on auditing and corporate governance. In auditing, I study issues such as auditor independence and government policy towards the auditing profession. In corporate governance, I study the best practices regarding board functioning. High-profile scandals all over the world, including Satyam in India, have put board governance at the center stage. In India, for the first time in the Companies Act of 2013, the director's duties were spelled out. SEBI followed with their listing obligations and disclosure regulations of 2015. And uh, these regulations have also made comprehensive rules regarding board function. So today, a director of any public company cannot function without a good broad level understanding of these provisions. This broad understanding is required for them to do their job effectively and to protect themselves from uh, violating their duties of care and loyalty. An important committee of the board is the audit committee. The new regulations cast a substantial responsibility on the audit committee to oversee the entire financial reporting system and uh, to review the end product of that financial reporting system that is the financial statements. For example, the audit committee must review and monitor the auditor's independence and performance. And considering that audit committees meet four to six to eight times a year at most, the question is how do they do that? How do they review and monitor the functioning of the auditor who has been in the company for the entire year? And particularly, how do they assess the auditor's independence? Because after all, independence is a state of mind. It is not just a matter of checking the box with respect to standards such as that an auditor cannot owe any debt to the company. Uh, if it was a matter of just checking whether they owe any debt or not, you don't need an audit committee to perform that job. So the audit committee has to assess the auditor's state of mind to make a determination that they have actually been independent. So the question is, uh, how do audit committees do that? What are the best practices in assessing the auditor's independence? The answer is that auditors, the audit committees should talk to auditors regularly without management presence. And it is important what questions they ask during this separate meeting. They should ask the auditors about uh, any difficulties faced by them, any restrictions on the scope or lack of access to personnel and other documents. The WorldCom board did not do that. And uh, that was a big factor for why there was that big WorldCom scandal in 2002. The audit committee must ask the auditors about whether there were any accounting adjustments that they proposed, but the company did not make. They should ask the auditors about uh, the budget and the staffing and the internal audit function and its effectiveness. And of course, this conversation needs to be approached sensitively. It is not a matter of trying to apportion blame on anybody. But done properly, these conversations can go a long way in uh, allowing the audit committees to fulfill their responsibility of uh, assessing the auditor's independence. 
Another important board committee is the Nomination and Remuneration Committee. It is responsible for setting the pay of the CEO and other key management personnel. Now, CEO pay has become a sensitive topic in India recently. Our research shows that promoter CEO pay in India is about 50% higher than non-promoter CEO pay, even after adjusting for company size differences. Moreover, the ratio of promoter CEO pay to that of the median employee in India is 213 is to 1 on average. The, in, the, on, in the average company, the CEO earns 213 times as much as the median employee. There is only one country in the world, the USA, which has a higher ratio. Uh, nomination and remuneration committees have gotten into difficulties recently in trying to get their approval of CEO pay ratified by the shareholders. Proxy advisory firms have advised against the approval in several cases. And in some of these cases, a majority of the shareholders have actually rejected the recommendation of the Nomination and Remuneration Committee. For example, Shobha and Ekta Kapoor's pay in Balaji Telefilms and Siddharth Lal's pay in Aishar Motors was rejected by the shareholders. Therefore, the question is how should Nomination and Remuneration Committees go about setting CEO pay and how should they justify it to the stakeholders? First, the economic logic. Economic logic dictates that pay packages need to be adequate to attract, motivate, and retain the right kind of talent. Otherwise, obviously, you won't get the right kind of talent. But besides economics, social views on pay legitimacy are also important. So there is a real question about whether a gap of 213 is to 1 is proper and appropriate. And uh, organizations and organizational arrangements that lack legitimacy will not sustain in the long term. So in view of all this controversy, in view of uh, the onerous task placed on the nomination and remuneration committees, they have their work cut out for them in terms of first arriving at the pay in a justifiable way, and then convincing stakeholders about that justification. Another area in which regulations have been tightened is in relation to risk management. Uh, risk management is supposed to help prevent risk events that can uh, sink the company. The Companies Act requires directors to certify that the company has an effective process of risk management in place. And uh, recently, SEBI has mandated that uh, the top 1,000 companies have a risk management committee in place as another committee of the board of directors. Uh, worldwide risk management for financial institutions has been required since the early 2000s. However, we know that uh, these requirements have not prevented the global financial crisis or even the more recent scandals, such as uh, the one at Wells Fargo, where uh, Wells Fargo was found guilty of rampant mis-selling. So there is a question, does risk management help at all in making organizations more ethical and in preventing meltdowns? That's a real question. Our research shows how some firms have made risk management work for their organizations. And they have done that by infusing risk management into the organizational culture. Another new requirement in the Companies Act is board evaluations. Every board of directors have to evaluate their performance collectively as well as uh, 
uh, evaluates the performance of each director. Now the regulations require this practice, but they do not specify a regimented method for it, which is overall a good thing. So companies that do board evaluations well find that it builds the right chemistry among board members, making them more effective so that uh, they reinforce each other's strengths and uh, the functioning of the board as a whole becomes synergistic, 2 plus 2 equal to 5. Board evaluations also improve board functioning mechanisms, the mechanism of agenda setting, information sharing, board committee functioning, and the committee's interface with the full board, which ultimately improves the board functioning. And uh, from an external point of view, doing these board evaluations well enhances the governance score, which is important in today's day and age when there are so many ESG-oriented investment funds. So in our research, we surveyed company secretaries to ask about the board evaluation practices in their companies. We found that most companies are in compliance with the law, but the company secretaries feel that the process should be made more rigorous. That is, they did not feel that uh, the board evaluations were being done as well as they should be done. We looked at annual reports of several companies and uh, we found that a small number of exemplars describe very well, the, all companies describe the process of board evaluations, but a small number of companies uh, describe what we call exemplars in how board evaluations should be done. And uh, we are doing detailed case studies on some of these exemplar companies. So at these exemplar companies, the board chairperson and the NRC, NRC chairperson drove the process. Then uh, feedback was collected about each board member from all the other board members. And this feedback was shared individually with each director by the board chairperson and the nomination and remuneration committee chairperson. And uh, the purpose and the end result of uh, this uh, feedback sharing was uh, to come up with specific improvement plans. Uh, some of these companies describe even what improvement plans were uh, determined as a result of this process. And importantly, these improvement plans were not just on paper. These companies describe how they subsequently monitored whether these improvement plans were actually implemented or not. In summary, every director in today's world has a lot to learn. The expectations have increased dramatically and the way the directors functioned five or ten years ago does not meet the expectations of them in today's world. As we have seen, directors at several companies have faced embarrassment or worse if they did not come up to the expectations of the stakeholders. I have a deep interest in learning more about the best practices of board functioning as well as in uh, disseminating what I have learned. Thank you.